Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer, where we talk about music and the methods for making music with top performers in the music industry. This week's featured guest is Ivan Funkboy Bodley. Ivan Funkboy Bodley has averaged 228 gigs a year for over a decade, has played approximately 3,000 shows, including playing on Broadway shows like Rock of Ages, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, and has played with 50 inductees, that's right, 5-0, not 1-5, 50 inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. His new book, Am I Famous Yet?, is available everywhere. You get your books, and you can also find him and his funky funky new single crab walk at funkboy.net that's f-u-n-k-b-o-y.net ivan thank you so much for coming on the show man thanks so much for having me did i do all that stuff did, did i tell you all that man listen your your bio and career is so long we could have just sat there for 10 minutes and i could have just rattled off all the places you've played all the people you've played with the people you've band led for You've had really an incredibly uh, just productive career. I mean, if if no other adjective is gonna is gonna come to mind, you've been immensely, immensely productive. Well, either that or I can't hold a job, depending on how you look at it. So yeah, you, you know, I appreciate your your interpretation of those uh, stats. You know, that makes more sense to me. But who knows? Who knows? Indeed, uh, Ivan. Quick question for you. What's a sure. what's a piece of music you've heard in the past couple of days that really stood out to you? Oh man, you know I'm constantly listening to things, um, um, and and lately I've been collecting uh, classic soul recordings and classic blue note jazz recordings and stuff that you know is wildly obscure 45s that were only ever a hundred copies ever pressed, you know, from the the or the, the Texas, the TSU tornadoes down in, in, uh, in Texas, you know, it was, it was like a high school music program, but they, in the seventies, but they ended up like releasing records, releasing vinyl records of, of the students playing sort of like these audaciously, you know, uh, um, earnest, like these kids are like really going for it, playing these, you know, just, just, you know, full, full volume funk tunes, you know, the, the TSU Tornadoes, you should look them up. They're so much fun. I just, one of those tracks came on the other day. I was like, man, these kids are really going for it. It's amazing. So it's a bunch of college kids in high the seven, uh, high school kids, excuse high me. School. Okay. Yeah. high school kids in the 70 playing funk tunes and in these Texas were, in Texas. And these were put out on Blue Note records, not on Blue Note. No, no, okay. they're 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 whoever their band director was. And I can't remember his name, like organized he did a series of albums sort of it was kind of like a graduation present like you would get an album that they would cut at the end of the year and these are like highly prized by collectors because of these amazing sort of like very obscure very rough but beautiful funk records that these kids made you know it's awesome really cool that is wild yeah so you've been a music director for some heavy hitters in the music industry, could you maybe describe for our audience what it means to be a music director? A music director. Okay. So in my experience, what that entails for like when I'm running a concert for, let's say, you know, a classic soul singer, uh, my job involves everything from sort of possibly contracting the band members to making sure the arrangements are together and or written and or transcribed. Uh, sometimes I got to generate those. Sometimes I have to collect them, distribute them. And can you sure break that down? Just that part right there. So sure. let's say you have no charts at all. Charts is going to be shorthand for the actual written music. Right. The sheet music. Right. Yeah. The sheet music. So what is it that you are going to do? Is it your job to then listen to the music and write out the drum part, write out the guitar part, write out the bass part in as much as you'll write them out. It'll probably be sort of more lead sheet style, right? Except for certain hits and certain parts, but that's going to be your job. Very often, yeah. Like many times, I've gotten the, I've inherited uh, a book of songs that has somewhere between zero and full written sheet music. You know, so if it's zero or somewhere in the middle, sometimes I have to go and I listen to the recordings. I transcribe the parts. You're right, though. I do tend to make like a general rhythm chart. You know, and the way I do that these days is I write out the bass part because I'm the bass player, so I'm reading the bass parts. So I got I do a, a full transcription of the bass part, but Within that, it has all the sections, all the chord changes, 
verses, all the choruses, all the hits, you know, all the band, every time the band's got a break. So I'll have a general rhythm chart. And then depending on how in depth I need to be, I may also have to transcribe the horns and arrange those and write those out and, you know, either copy the voicings on the record or make voicings of my own, depending on if I have two or three horns that may or may not match what, what was on the record. So yeah, very often times I have to spend a lot of time generating charts, charts for the, for the gig. And will how in depth the charts go also depend on who you're calling for the gig? Like if you have a certain guitar player who you know just has the ear for it and you show him the charts and he's going to be good, like then do you just hand him a lead sheet versus Johnny who needs everything written out? Sorry, Johnny. So, so I'm sorry to call you out, Johnny. No, no, John, Johnny's cool. He's cool. He's a cool. No, with it, you're right. It does depend on the gig and it depends on where I know these charts are going to go. So mm. if, it, if they're my guys, you know, that I've called, they're my band. I know that they're readers, you know, again, the general, uh, the general rhythm chart, which will really be like in sort of an enhanced bass transcription, Will usually be enough for those guys. Um, but if if that said, if there are specific things that I need, you know, that are that are famous, that are part of the recording that we're trying to, you know, I'll write those out separately and there'll be a separate piano part that has the specific licks written on it, even if they're my guys. So I want them to know that no, that part's important. That needs to be there every time, you know. But also I'm thinking forward to because there are a lot of times where I'm I'm using pickup bands on the road. So they'll fly just the singers and me out as a music director. So I'll be using a bunch of musicians that I've never met before. And in that case, I try to make the, the sheet music as general and friendly as possible. So there are chord symbols. And again, like each section is delineated very clearly. Here's the verse, here's the chorus, you know, so depending on the level of the, of the reading ability that the people have, you know, I'm trying to make it survivable, whatever their level of ability is, because I've had to really try to make some things work out there in the provinces, as you can imagine, you know. And just to break down a pickup band, the idea is you because you're the band leader, you and the act, the talent, the headliner, the person whose name is on the marquee, you guys are going to be flying from city to city, but to save money. Instead of flying the band along, you'll pick up a new band, which is why I call it a pickup band, in each city along the way. So it's just a guitar player who can get by, a drummer who can get by, a keyboard player who can get by. And you actually talk about Bo Diddley right. doing this right. in your book, and you were actually part of Bo Diddley's pickup band. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? that? That was the first sort of gig that I did that sort of felt legitimate, like with a real sort of national headlining kind of act. And that was also the first time I was introduced to the concept of what a pickup band was. He was coming to New Orleans when I was living there and, and going to school there. And uh, he just showed up by himself with a guitar. So the booking agent's job was to find a local band, you know, as well as the venue and the promoter and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I knew the booking agent and I said, oh, you know, I think I'd, I'd love to do that. Can you get me an audition for the thing? And so I had to go sit in with the band leader who was actually going to be leading the job. And... And the thing was with Bo, Bo's music is amazing. All of his songs are basically one chord each. It's not even like a three chord blues song. It's like one chord with that with the famous Bo Diddley beat. And he uses an open E tuning on his guitar. His guitar is tuned to an open E chord. So um, the rehearsal was this. If the capo was on the third fret, you're in G. If the capo was on the fifth fret, you're in A. If there was no capo, you were, you, you were in E. End of rehearsal. That was it. That's all the information you got. And you just, you know, followed him and, and listened and watched. And he did like a 90 minute show of these one chord songs. And it was uh, endlessly entertaining. He was a, a master showman. Uh, it was such a such an experience to get to play with him and also an education to realize that, you know, you can make music with the, with very little rehearsal if you sort of know what you're doing and have like minded individuals around you. Uh, and again, his music, you know, harmonically was was very not challenging, but rhythmically it was very challenging. So you had to have a decent feel, and, you know, and again, like the, the audition that I had to do with the band leader was just sort of like, you know, can I play a groove, a pocket? Even though I hadn't been to music school at that point, I really didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, it was enough for Bo and it worked out great. It was fun. Can you talk a little bit about when you did go to music school, you went to Berkeley back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who went to Berkeley back in the day talks about it as going to Berkeley back in the day because back then they were like the only 
modern music school, even now that they, they are obviously the the top in terms of modern music schools, um, especially in this country and then also globally. But um, back then they were like the only option on the block. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there? Sure. Actually, there were probably about three options at that, at that time, to oh, be really? fair. So okay. uh, University of Miami had a program that was sort of jazz based. North Texas State University, believe it or not, had a, a great conservatory program. And then well, there was, but it was it was it jazz or conservatory? But the thing for the thing about Berkeley, it's always been uh, focused towards modern music. Like even if you go look back at the old, old, old textbooks, they're teaching you to read not just for jazz. They go into jazz because that's obviously where the most complex harmony lies. Right, exactly. But it really is focused on modern music. It really is, because uh, Berkeley was started in the 40s as GIs were coming back from World War II, and they had money from the GI Bill. So uh, 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 Lee Burke decided to, to begin this program, and it was basically, it started with big band arranging. That's why it's a jazz-based school. So yeah, it was very modern at the time. And the theory at Berkeley, I think, you know, I'm not, I can't speak for them, but what I believe as a, and as an alumni, I would, would say that their theory is like, if you can play jazz, you can kind of play anything. Like it gives you enough sort of foundation. So I say that it's a jazz-based curriculum, even though you're absolutely correct. It's very much aware of modern rock, modern programming, uh, sound design, uh, mp &E, music production engineering, all that stuff. But it started from big band arranging. Huh. And, and, and North Texas State and University of Miami had a similar sort of program. And then there was like the Musicians Institute out in Hollywood with BIT, GIT, you know, the, that were kind of, that was more of a trade school, kind of a one year sort of intensive program. But Berkeley was kind of, you know, at that time, you're right, that was sort of like the, the gold standard for that sort of thing. Uh, and I went there a little later in life. I already had an undergraduate degree at Tulane University in psychology, and I was sort of in the music business before all that. So when I decided I was going to go ahead and, and try to really get my ducks in a row to be a musician, that's when I decided I needed to fill in the gaps in my education. And that's when I went to Berkeley and I managed to graduate there, although I powered through. I was in and out like 18 months. I went five straight semesters and got in and got out, you know. So you got a degree in 18 months straight. I did. I did. I did. That's intense, man. <laughs> it was intense. It was nonstop. I had a little transfer credit from my uh, previous college. I had studied privately. This is interesting, too. I studied privately with a guy in London uh, when I lived there for a short time who taught me the entire Berkeley Harmony system, although I didn't know what he was teaching me at the time. He just, you know, he just had this is his curriculum. He had to go through this guy named Joe Hubbard. He's a great bass teacher in London, if anybody wants to study with this guy. So when you get to Berkeley, you take a, a placement exam when you get there because everybody has sort of different levels of uh, education because there's, you know, educational, especially music education in this country is very spotty and it's very, you know, disparate levels of, of ability. So you take this placement exam so they can sort of figure out what level you're at in each discipline. So when I got there, I placed out of two years of harmony, like all of their harmony requirements I'd already know, knew and, you know, the, I was immediately ready to start taking electives, you know, and the advanced harmonization techniques and reharm and all that kind of stuff. So, that, you know, he saved me two years worth of tuition studying privately with this guy. So I tell people, like, you don't have to go to Berkeley. You can study with people. You can be an autodidact and pick up this information on your own. I, I think you should study, but I don't think you have to necessarily have a music degree. But, yeah, he saved me a lot of time over there. Can you talk a little bit about you know, in the book, you talk about how hard it the work really is to prepare for a gig and to prepare for a gig properly, like to truly show up and have a mastery over 90 minutes of music. It's a lot of work. Can you talk a little bit about your attitude towards this sort of really intense, um, essentially just repertoire uh, absorption? that you yeah. do on regular bases and how you approach that. Yeah, I kind of hate it, <laughs> but it's part, exactly as you say, it's part of the job. And especially as a bass player, the bass player, we kind of have to be able to commit to a root note on every downbeat. So you can't sort of jam through knowing the songs in E and just kind of play something in E and kind of make it through. Like if guitar player, you can kind of noodle around and play in the key and probably sound like you're okay or, play a little funk part in, in E and you, you, you'll get by, fine. 
<clears throat> a drummer can kind of play in 4-4 all night and probably survive the gig. Not even if you don't really know the song, you might miss some of the endings possibly, you know. But the bass player has to know all of the chord changes all the time. So it's a little different level of responsibility, you know, and especially if it's a situation where I'm, I'm music directing, which means I'm conducting the band and also like cueing other people. I really have to know my stuff. Um, and I writing charts, you know, that's just a curse that I've borne with me my entire career. So I have my iPad sitting next to me and it's got, uh, I think, over 4,000 charts in it by now. So these are just transcriptions that I've done and or collected along the way, and they're all with me at all times. So like when somebody says, uh, do you know uh, Billy Joel just the way you are? I'm like, one moment, please. <laughs> like, yes. And I don't have it memorized for sure, but, you know, I have it written out so that I can survive things. Uh, and, you know, and that would be like on a wedding gig where, where you might be playing a thousand different things. And you might, might not have to really know it that well. But if you're playing with, a concert with the artist who, you know, made these songs famous, you really, really have to be on your game. You have to understand the structure of the song. You have to really know the original part, the, you know, the recorded part that's famous. You know, you need to know what that is and, and make some important decisions, whether you're trying to exactly replicate that or modify it slightly for a live context, you know. So in that case, I'll do like full transcriptions, you know, of of the song so i know exactly what's happening and and yeah i've been writing charts for 30 years i think something that is also interesting to bring up is because of a lot of the soul and sort of a uh, motown kind of bass parts are not just hanging out on the root the whole time. There's a lot of movement. There's dynamic things. They're, they're actual critical musical elements and themes within those bass parts alone, where on a lot of those recordings, the guitar player is just chunking along on some chords. Right. And really the two most distinctive things that are happening are the vocals and the bass. Well, if you think about a song like My Girl by The Temptations, everybody That's in the literally world, the song I was thinking of just now, yes. Everybody in the world knows that bass part. Yeah. If you don't play that song in that manner with that articulation and that register, you're blowing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And again, if you're playing it on a wedding or something, you might be able to get away with it. But when you play with one of the original members of The Temptations, which I've done, you really need to know what's happening, you know, like uh, have studied it. Um, I also... Uh, been very fortunate to sub on a show called Ain't Too Proud to Beg, which is the, the Temptations musical on Broadway. So that's like this unbelievable, it's like two and a half hours of James Jamerson, the great bass player from Motown transcriptions. And you're just like, you know, you're, you're just powering through a mountain of notes, you know, for two and a half hours straight. It, the bass never stops in that show practically, you know. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. And there's a lot of famous parts that people really know. So you got to be on top of your game. You can't fake it. There's no way. To uh, get the appropriate bass sound for that show, do you have to throw your bass in the back of a, like an old 50s car and drive it through a, <laughs> dri dri drive it through the freezing winter, burning summer, fall, rain, sleet, snow, then you show up at the show and the wood's just going to be just right at that point? You know, if you're a purist, a purist, yeah, that's exactly what you need to do. That said, however, the show bass, and the thing with the Broadway show is like, you don't bring your own instrument, instrument to that show. You use the show bass because it's already been tacked. It's, it's really? Hard. Yes. You're going into battle wearing another man's fatigue is what you're doing. So huh. that, that instrument's been teched. The sound levels have been checked. So it is a P bass with flat wounds on it. It's period correct. It's got foam under the bridge, you know, by the, uh, down by the strings under the bridge. Uh, to give it that really thuddy sound. It's going through a Sans amp, you know, which gives it that really dirty kind of Jamerson wow. Motown direct sound. It's like they've done a really amazing job over there. But you have to know all of those things about the signal chain to sort of get that sort of awesome authenticity beyond just what the notes are, you know, like the, the type of bass, the type of strings. He's actually got the heavier uh, Labella strings on it. Like He's got the same string gauges that Jamerson used on his bass. Wow. Which are, are a lot heavier than the normal, you know, everyday bass strings. And they're it's really hard to play. <laughs> that, that, that bass is really hard to play, actually. But but it's the correct sound. It's the correct sound for that show, you know. 
And uh, j- just to clue our listeners in on on the joke, they might not have gotten it. Uh, James Jamerson, uh, monster, monster bass player uh, for a lot of the Motown records, uh, was known for literally just throwing his bass in the back of cars. Oh, yeah. When they were driving around. And then like that would... Anyone with a modern instrument who understands anything about instrument care is shuddering at the thought of doing that. But like, so you have humidity, which makes the wood swell. You have heat, which makes the wood expand. You have dryness, which makes the wood um, uh, contract. And then you have cold, which makes the wood contract. And then th- this is essentially the per- the perfect storm to have a cracked or warped instrument to some degree. But apparently everything was fine. It was and so fine. The- and also he used the same. He, he never, ever, ever changed strings. The strings he used were the strings that came with the bass. And he had the same set of strings on for over 10 or 12 years, I think, you know, so one of them finally broke. And he actually went to the string company to ask them if they could fix the A string. He wanted wanted them to solder it back together because he played on so many hits for that A string. They're like, no, man, we can give you a new set. You know, don't, don't worry about it, you know. But yeah, it was, there was a lot of funk in the funk with that, with that situation over there. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach collaboration? Because you worked with so, so many artists and you don't get called to work with an artist, then called to work with another artist unless you're a good collaborator. So can you talk a little bit about the attitude and then also the music and how you approach collaboration? Right. Well, I think you really have to understand what your function is in the situation. You know, for a situation where I'm being called to put together a band or lead a band for a, you know, a classic soul singer, you know, my job is to make their life easier so they can just go out and do their show and be, you know, not have to think about the band, not worry about what we're, what's going on behind them. They just can worry about relating to the audience and, you know, uh, doing their improvisations or whatever it is. So, so my role is like sort of the ultimate, kind of supportive role in that situation. Um, So the collaborative aspect of it, that means sort of as I'm getting to know the artist and getting to understand what it is that they need to make them comfortable, you know, sort of like, so that, and that, that is a relationship. It's hard to know sort of the first time you meet somebody, but after you've done a few shows, you start to understand like what their routines are, you know, uh, what their cueings, might be, you know, what kind of cues they, they might or might not give. Sometimes they're not good at giving cues. You know, they just step back from, from the microphone and go, okay, that's the cue. You know, you just kind of learn to read their minds through the back of their or their skulls kind of thing. Uh, you know, and then you you learn things about sometimes their stage mix, the monitor mix has to be a certain way for them to be comfortable. Um, and, you know, and then it, it's interesting because we're not like in a situation like that, you're not creating, you're not writing new music, but you're creating a, a live event that they may have ideas. You know, I've always wanted to try so-and-so with, uh, you know, with this song. Can we do it with the band? And my job is to say, yes, we can. And then I got to figure out how to do that, you know, obviously. But so it's, it is collaborative, but I'm also, you know, I work for them. And that's, I always have to keep that in mind. Like, you know, their name's on the marquee, their faces on the billboard, not mine. So I'm just trying to make their lives as easy as possible. And then hopefully they'll call me back for the next one. Have you ever had moments in time where you've suggested something where it's not just taking what the artist wants, but you see there's an opportunity for something to be made better. And so you speak up. I have, uh, although you have to do it sort of judiciously again, you you know, uh, you you have sort of have to understand your role in the room. So there are certain things that I, I'll do just sort of knowing how it's going to work. Like, you know, a certain horn voicing or, or horn arrangement or something, I'll, I'll write something out. And I, I, I won't necessarily consult with the artist on every single facet of that. Because I know I've got people that are good players, good readers, and I know what the voicings are, they're going to work. So I just kind of hand them out. And then if I get any feedback from the artist, you know, then I'll, of course, make adjustments. Um, there was one kind of notable time where I... I, I I took a chance. I kind of stepped out of, I almost stepped out of line with this thing. We were doing, um, it was a really big show. It was kind of, a, it was Sam Moore from Sam and Dave. And we were playing the first Obama inauguration, a, a big ball, the big, you know, all these Hollywood types were there, big, big stars. Mm-hmm. 
And Sam had a couple of special guests with him that, that night, uh, Elvis Costello and Sting, right? So, you know, they're sitting in with us with a soul band. There's the Memphis style soul band, you know, and then they would do a duet with Sam and then they would do a song or two on their own kind of thing. So, um, you know, Sting, I've been playing police songs since the very first time I ever played in public in my first high school talent show, you know, so we knew he was going to do uh, Every Breath You Take with the band, you know, and, and Every Breath You Take, you know, it's the police. There's three people playing on it. And, you know, and I've got a 14 piece band on stage. So I am i didn't want to sort of like have everybody take a break. I wanted to kind of have this Memphis style soul band playing Every Breath You Take. So what I did was I wrote a horn arrangement for it. Just kind of, just sort of gentle, just kind of, oh, can't you see? And then the voice, the horns would just come in with the voice and just hold on. Bah, bah, bah. And, I, and I told the guys, I said, you know, don't, don't give him any idea that what's about to happen. Let's just see if he, if he likes it first before we, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but it's a little rude to sort of, you know, uh, make a decision like that uh, with a piece of rock and roll history without consulting the artist first. But I didn't have access to him first, you know, like I just had to show up and do it. So when he got to that point in the rehearsal, he said, oh, can't you see? The horns came in with their voice and his head snapped around immediately. Like, he was like, whoa, what the hell is that? And I was like, my whole career flashed before my eyes. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm, I'm probably fired. But he was like, he was smiling. He loved it, you know. In fact, he ended up using that same horn arrangement a couple of different times that I know about with other bands. So, Oh, that's awesome. But it was a, it was a chance, you know. I took a little bit of a chance on that one, and uh, it, it worked out. But you know, you you got to really be careful, you know, for overstepping your bounds, you know. So, reading through your book, you don't really talk about having any formal auditions as such. It really seems that most of the time, it's like you're playing somewhere. You're gonna sit in with so and so. So and so comes to see a set hands you an envelope with the you know the material to learn for another gig is there any time that perhaps i might have missed in the book or you didn't put in the book where you actually had to formally audition for something yeah i i'm terrible at auditions i hate doing them and i'm not good at it so the auditions that are they're that sort of uh, infamous in my own view are in the chapter called gigs i didn't get and why so those are the times uh, yes. when I would have auditions and then like yeah. blow it, you know, or, or just sort of not be able to, to do what they wanted, you know, what needed me to do. So it's, as you say, that was, it's like a less than half a dozen times in my life that I've even been in an audition at all, you know, much less got it or didn't get it. But so most everything we do, especially around the New York area, is just word of mouth referral. You meet this person on that job and you never know what's going to lead to what. Like you can't tell. I met the Uptown Horns. You know, I met Chris Mancio, the leader on that, uh, like on a $50 blues gig. You know, you just you just don't know. And it turned into like, you know, a 25 year collaboration with those guys. But very little auditions. And so what is your thought process process or feeling around the sort of uh, philosophy of every gig is an audition and every performance is an audition and every sound check is an audition. Right. Uh, Crisp and Sia, who I just mentioned, we talk about this a lot. You know, our sort of attitude is, you know, we play, we try to play every gig as if it's Madison Square Garden. Not that we're, you know, shouting to the rafters, but I'm saying like we try to bring in our A game every time because, again, you never know who's watching. You never know what's going to lead to what. And, you know, even if it's, you know, five people in a bar, if they paid an admission price, even if they haven't paid an admission price, you've been hired to, you know, come provide entertainment for the evening. Sort of you deserve it. Uh, you just, they deserve to be entertained. And, you know, the music deserves just out of respect for the music. Like, I don't I don't like to play music where I'm just kind of like phoning things in. It's never comfortable for us, you know. So you try to play each gig as if people are listening, you know. Can you talk a little bit about the human connection for getting more gigs? Because like we just talked about, it's not like you're out auditioning every week. There's a lot of referrals, word of mouth. Um, and this is also something you talk about in the book about sort of being a good person and really trying to treat others with respect and trying to be kind to others and give other people the benefit of the doubt. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I think 
I remember reading early on somewhere, I don't know, in a guitar magazine or something like, but all the like the heavy, successful session musicians, the people that played on album after album after album, were all those like part of their secret was they're 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 nice people. They're just easy to get along with because that's such a part of every situation, you know, like you're not only just playing music with your mouth shut, you know. The, you know, if you're on a tour situation, you're doing that for an hour or two a day, and then you've got 23 hours together in the van, you know, like you have to be able to get along with people for them to want to call you back for anything and or refer you to anything else. Because I've heard so many uh, times, like uh, somebody said, like, yeah, that, that person is a great player, but they're a pain in the butt to deal with, you know, so like we want to get somebody who's who's fun to be around as well as, you know, maybe not the best player, but certainly like, you know, it's, it's a combination of things that sort of make you uh, employable in that kind of situation. Uh, and yeah, you know, you also have to, especially as a side man, which is most of what I do, you know, you, you have to eat a lot of crap sometimes, you know, because somebody else has had a bad day or things aren't going well, or somebody had a flat tire and you just have to kind of absorb it and you know keep smiling through it all and then at the end of the day they, they think well you know this guy was easy, easy to get along with so maybe we'll call him for the next thing you know those are all my um sort of book related questions Do you have anything that we didn't talk about that you think we should talk about in relation to the book the book uh here's my sort of like summary way of thinking about the book you know it's a lot of road stories it's a lot of anecdotes it's a lot of crazy things that happen you know like y'all ain't gonna believe this kind of thing you know but then i also sort of spent a lot of time you know introspectively sort of trying to think about what fame is as a concept like the book the full title of the book is uh, am i famous yet memoir of a working class rock star so like i've done all this kind of famousy stuff but I've also done a lot of working for a living, like, you know, dragging my amp into catering halls and play weddings, funerals and bar mitzvahs, you know. Um, and I, it, it, the fame thing is, is sort of interesting. Like when you would play, a, a, when I would sub on Rock of Ages and play a performance on Broadway, you know, when you come out of the stage door, there's a line of people and they want autographs and they want to take pictures and you're a rock star all the way up until you turn the corner on 7th Avenue. And then you immediately fade back into obscurity. Like, so you're only famous for like half a half a city block in New York City, right? So, you know, I spent a lot of time introspectively trying to think what fame is, how it constitutes some perception of success in your life, you know, and whether that's necessary or not. You know, like, uh, again, I've, I've been famous for very short periods of time <laughs> in very specific venues, you know, uh, and and it's fine. You know, I, I think sort of the ultimate um, conclusion I came to is like, I just love playing music and I would probably play the bass if I just had a, you know, a local uh, restaurant gig every week that I just enjoyed collaborating with other people and interacting with other people, not, you know, just musically kind of thing. I think I would do it no matter what, you know, even if it wasn't my my bread and butter, which it is. And I'm very fortunate to to have had it be so for so many years, but there was no guarantee when I started out doing this that I was going to be able to pay my rent. You know, it's it's a tough business to get into and you have to have all of your skills and all of your ability and all of your personality, but then you also have to be lucky on top of that. Like a lot of things have to go right for it to really sort of work out. And you don't know, like I'm able to look in the rear view now 30 years and go like, okay, I've had a career doing this. But there was no guarantee that this was going to happen. And, you know, I don't regret a minute of it. I'm glad I, I played music. Um, and I would probably do it whether I was quote unquote famous or not, you know. Based on talking with folks who have sort of hit that luck jackpot and have found this fame and then also just research and reading. My question for you is, are you ever grateful that you have not become sort of Hollywood famous and that you've managed to maintain doing what you love for a living 
and not having it be a thing where you have to get mobbed by people or stop and take photos with people and things like that? Or do you think you would have been open to it? <laughs> I have to stop and take photos with people now. People, <laughs> they think I'm somebody, you know, I get stopped in airports all the time. People want to take photos. Like, well, they want to... that's also because as you said, as you said in your book, they think you're Gene Simmons. They yeah, think yeah, you're yeah. Kenny G. Yeah, yeah. What, what else do people ask you if you are? Oh, oh, I got a bunch of them. Weird Al Yankovic, yes. uh, you know, uh, 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 Secretary John Kerry. Some people think I am <laughs> Jay Leno. I don't know. It's like a facial thing or the hair. Some people can't see past hair. You know, it's funny. You know, I don't know. I, I don't think I was ever in danger of being that famous that, you know, it was, you can't go out in public sort of famous. That's That's a very rarefied sort of level of the business. I, I think we probably all fantasize about that. But, you know, I've seen Paul McCartney on Madison Avenue in New York City. Like I've seen him on the street. Like he's there. You know, he's he can go out in, in public and he's probably the most famous musician in the world, you know, but he can still walk down Madison Avenue only being slightly molested by a few fans, you know, kind of thing. So I never thought I was sort of in danger of, of that per se. Um, but I, I certainly would have uh, uh, would enjoy, you know, being more recognizable than I am on a certain degree. But then again, I also talk about this in the book, too. Like, let's say you're Janet Jackson famous. You've sold 10 million records, right? That, you know, that means in the United States, there's like another, uh, what, 320 million people who don't know who you are and don't care. Right. So. You know, my parents don't know who Janet Jackson is. They never did, right? So even people that I've worked for who are quote unquote famous, you know, they're only famous among people who know them, you know, and it might be a million people, but it, it's a certain demographic or if it's a certain, you know, uh, uh, geographical location. Like, you know, I, I remember um, this artist named Jennifer Rush uh, who was on the record label of Epic Records when I worked at Epic, you know, and she was, or she was on Columbia downstairs, I think. But she had had the, I think the top selling, she certainly had the top selling single in the United Kingdom um, for that calendar year and maybe of like all time, like she was maybe second to only Supremes and sort of like single sales at that time. She was from Queens, right? And nobody in this country knew who she was at all. You know, and in the UK, she was like wildly, wildly famous. So fame is like a tenuous thing. And I never, you know, you have to get to like, you know, the next, next level, like the McCartney or Brad Pitt to be like so famous that you really can't go out in public ever, you know. And again, that's such a rarefied air that I don't think that was ever a danger for me, you know. <laughs> well, I was thinking, you know, some of these the auditions you didn't get, the the gigs you didn't get, um, excuse me, I'm forgetting the exact name of the chapter, but you talk about play, Keith Richards saying, why don't you come over and jam? Uh, you talk about, was it Tom it, it, Petty? It was Keith's producer was like, you know, yeah. was like, you know we got to get you over to the house, man. You got to play with Keith. I'm like, great. Love to. Anytime, you know, and the call never came. And then they actually booked me for, they booked me like, so like, can you show up and we're doing a session with Hubert Sumlin? The Keith is on. I don't know if he's going to be in the session, but I was going to be on playing on tape with Keith Richards. And I was like, yeah, 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 I can do it. No problem. No problem. And then they called me back, I think later that day or the next day. And I'm like, yeah, we decided to go another way. We're not going to do the track. And I was like, oh, dude, those are like, there are a couple of real big near misses like that, you know, and it's just kind of like, what what can you do? Shrug and move on. Didn't Hubert Sumlin play guitar for Howlin' Wolf? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. One of the all-time masters, which is why Keith Richards wanted to play with him, yeah. because he was one of his heroes, you know. And then they called me to come replace, they had the track done, but they needed to be re replace the bass part on this one thing for some reason. And I was like, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. And then they called right back and said, yeah, we're not going to do it. I'm like, all oh, right, fine, <laughs> fine, no problem. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions now around performance and creativity. Uh, this yeah. is the second half of the podcast, not in terms of duration, but in content. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how uh, you like to practice and how you find different parts of your life affect your ability to perform and play. So what is the number of hours of sleep you need to get so that the next day you feel zero impact on your creativity or performance? 
Seven and a half to eight. Seven and a half to eight. Uh, do you, have you ever used mindfulness or meditation to have an impact on uh, creativity or performance? See, you needed to ask me, do I actually get seven and a half or eight? That was the next oh, question. Oh, no, I read your book. I know you don't. <laughs> rarely, rarely does that happen. Yeah, that's what I need. And that's not what I get. No, I'm not good with the, I mean, you know, I have the mindfulness concept and I have the meditation concept and I've certainly tried to, you know, make myself concentrate on my breathing to fall asleep. But I'm not, I'm not well versed in it. I don't have any skills in that sort of practice and I don't use it intentionally enough. Uh, do you exercise? And if so, how do you feel that impacts your creativity and ability to perform? I try to run five miles a day every day. Whoa. Uh, six days a week. I, I do try to take a, a day off because my feet hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you're running that Because you miles ran like 30 miles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My feet hurt. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of like, it, it's, it, that's kind of my meditation kind of uh. therapy is doing that and sort of like, you know, getting the endorphins going, getting the, the circulation going, uh, and fitness has been a, a very important part of my routine for, you know, many decades now. Yeah. And how does that impact your ability to perform? And second half of that question or second question, how do you sustain that? Or how do you balance it out when you're actually on the road? Uh, take a pair of shoes with me on the road. And if I can, if I can get a run in, in the morning, you know, somewhere wow. on the road, I, I will do it. It's not always possible if it's a travel day, but even if it means getting up a couple of hours earlier so I can go out and, you know, I'm, I'm five miles I'm doing in my 45 minutes, it's kind of thing. So it's not a, a, a gigantic uh, time commitment. Um, you know, and uh, there was a time where I was sort of trying to use elliptical machines because I was nursing an ankle injury for a while. And, you know, you can find those in most hotels kind of thing there's a there's a gym down there so i've been pretty good about doing that on the road i'm leaving uh i'm leaving town this week i'm leaving leaving friday morning and coming back wednesday morning and i'll be i've already sort of mapped out in my mind okay i can probably get a run in saturday morning sunday morning probably not friday like i'm already knowing like what days i'm going to be able to run not be able to run kind of thing and but and it's so important just for mind and body and uh, keeps your stamina together it keeps your um, your circulation going like it, it allows me to do what i do because a lot of the stuff you know a lot of the gigs are kind of grueling like you know there's some long drives involved some of the wedding gigs are five hours i did one of the six hours the other day i played for six hours so you you know if you strap a 10 pound board to your stomach for six hours your back is going to feel it you know, but because I, I run every day, it's sort of like, yeah, I felt it, but I was I was okay by the end of it. You know? mm. and, and I think I even drove 12 hours round trip that same day, too. So, you know, that was probably my worst day in a long time in terms of like number of hours required for a gig. But, you know, you, it made my rent in one day, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So it's all part of it. Ooh. How do people in your life support your ability to make music and perform? I've been very lucky with that. My, my family was always very supportive. You know, my, my dad was a, a mechanical automotive engineer with the Tennessee Valley Authority, the government um, uh, utility down in Tennessee where I grew up. And his sort of attitude was kind of like, whatever I could do to be self-sufficient, A, and B, happy, he was great. Like, he was happy to sort of, as long as I didn't come home looking for money all the time, you know, he would definitely help out if I needed help, you know, if I needed, like, he actually, uh, he actually fronted me my first uh, semester of tuition at Berkeley, because when I applied, I was a little late getting, I didn't get the financial aid documents in, in time. So he actually fronted me the money as a loan to like and pay him back kind of thing. So, you know, having that kind of support in life, really gives you some options. Like, you know, I knew my whole life, I was never going to be homeless. I was never going to go hungry. Mm. You know, I mean, that's just a tremendous level of security to have. Uh, and now these days, you know, uh, uh, my partner of seven years, uh, she, she's a, a Broadway conductor and a pianist. So like we have a very similar type of lifestyle. So like she's out of town now for a month doing a show out of town, you know, and you have to have uh, a partner who's understanding of that kind of time constraint. Like you go where the gig is and, you know, uh, you're going to be apart for a month. 
Um, so you know, she's coming back next. She's coming back this weekend, right as I'm leaving town. So oh. I'm going to be I'm going to be gone for a week while she's home. You know that kind of thing. And that's you know you have to have that sort of uh, mutual understanding. And we're both sort of each other's biggest cheerleaders as, mm. that, as it goes. So I'm you know when she gets a gig out of town. I, I always go like, I, you know, I'm really happy for you. I'm going to be sorry to miss you for that period of time. You know, maybe I can come visit or something like that. But that you have to have that sort of uh, flexibility to be able to go do gigs, you know, travel. Have you ever had a relationship in the past where it wasn't that the the person you were with didn't understand the lifestyle? They didn't get what your commitments were. A little bit, but not too much because I've been this, you know, uh, I've been this version of myself kind of my whole adult life, really. So like, you know, you kind of like the first time you meet me, you know, okay, this guy, this guy goes to, goes to Italy to play one night and comes back, you know, that's just what he does, you know, and so that, that's part of the package deal. And I think they all know it getting into it, you know. Do you define yourself as a musician, a human who plays music or something else? Hmm. Uh, I think I even put it right there in the title of the book. I'm a working class musician. That's definitely what I am. You know, it's a craft. I've spent, you know, my life pursuing, you know, perfecting my craft to the best of my ability. It's a constant um, pursuit to keep, you know, improving your whole life. It's a lifelong thing. You know, you'll always be able to, to sort of get better at what you do, even if it's just getting more efficient at what you do. But I definitely feel that I am a, you know, a musician. That's what I do. Do you have a time or times of day when you prefer to practice? Yes, I, never. The answer is never. <laughs> I never prefer to practice, but it's part of what I do. So I have to practice. So like, <sighs> you know, what happens is I get up in the morning. I, I, can, I can tell you the whole schedule right now because we've just had 15 months of this, you know, like sitting home. I get up in the morning and I look at the emails and answer what I got to do on the computer for an hour. Then I go run for like an hour. Then I take a shower. Then I make a, a giant salad. Then I sit down and I procrastinate for about you know, another hour, maybe. Then and only then do I pick up the bass and do the practice that I need to do, prepare for the gig I need to prepare for. So, yeah, it'll it'll it's going to be five to six hours into the day before I you know just kind of resign myself to the fact that I got it's time to shed. Got to do it. And that after you've resigned yourself to the fact that it's time to shed, about how much time on average are you going to be practicing a day? An, uh, an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. These days, it's a maintenance sort of thing. Mostly. Yeah. I mean, for the, it, it depends. And it also depends sort of what I have coming up. If I've got to prepare a lot of repertoire, you know, I don't, I don't consider writing charts practice, but I do spend time transcribing. I've been playing tonight with a guy, uh, out on Long Island, and I, he's got he, this, a huge list of classic rock songs. And I probably knew about 90% of them or I had charts in my iPad for 90% of them. But then I wrote like nine charts for this gig, which means, you know, in the, a, a, a transcription, a bass transcription of a Tom Petty song is going to take you between 45 minutes to an hour average for each chart. You know, that's just kind of average. But then, you, you know, you have the chart in perpetuity, you know, beyond that. So you know, yeah, I've done like nine hours of prep for this gig that I'm going to play tonight that's going to pay me 150 bucks, you know, and it's it's part of what we do. Um, but I don't count that towards the practice time. But uh, for the whole pandemic, I decided I needed to get my my bowing of the electric of the upright bass together mm. because uh, most Broadway shows these days like have one or two songs on upright and one or two songs that you play with the bow. And I was, you know, I'm not a classical guy at all. I was, you know, raised in rock bands playing Fender bass guitar. So, you know, it's like when you pick up the bow, it's almost like if you played guitar, uh, somebody said like, great, you sound great on guitar. Now, here's a fly swatter. Now play the guitar with that. You know, it's, it's a completely different type of tone production. It's completely foreign to me. So I just sort of took it upon myself to kind of train myself to do it. So I've been spending an hour a day just playing with a bow and working on my sight reading um, during the pandemic to kind of see if I can improve myself slightly in that, in that respect. And, and PS, I have no gig coming up that I know that I need to play with a bow. I just think that it probably won't hurt me to have this in my back pocket, you know, and it was kind of the least spectacular of all of my parlor tricks was the bow, <laughs> like it's the stuff I knew I needed to work on. So yeah, I've been doing that an hour a day for the last 
15 months and I don't think I'm very much better at it. I'll be honest. Uh oh, Arco. So, uh, what's the maximum length of time back in the day that you practiced for maybe technique? Technique in school, like you had this idea, like you really have to, you know, you, you read about people that they all go through this intensive period of practice. So there were days, not many days, but you would, it would be like six to eight hours. Technique, pure. Yeah. Yeah. Brutal. But not, 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 not a lot of that, you know, mm. like it's more like, you know, I could say if you can sort of do an hour a day kind of thing, just for technique, if you're just blowing chops for an hour, sort of that's, that's kind of enough to maintain most things and keep your stamina and, and build your speed up and that kind of thing too. But Maybe we should talk about this because this is also something you talked about in the book. It's about, you know, you sort of built your skill set around being a functional bass player. So not around, you know, being able to do like set tuplet slapping, you know, <laughs> with all with with all five fingers on your right hand. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, listen, no, that's absolutely no disrespect to the guys who do that. Like, I I, I, love, I, I love Victor Wooten as much as the next guy or the Stanley Clarks or all, all, all those incredible, incredible players. Um, that being said, it's it's almost a different instrument um approaching it to play from a functional perspective could you maybe talk a little bit about that a hundred percent because it has immediate bearing to my entire career path you know when i started out i knew for a fact i'm going to be just like stanley clark just like jaco pastorates i'm going to be this bass hero gunslinger fusion ace that's what i'm going to do i knew it i was like this is what i'm going to do and i even went so far as to study with stanley i studied with stanley he's an old friend of mine i've known him 35 years now Took some lessons with him, and then um, he he told me some amazing things. He just sort of like and and, the, the, and how this this technique that he's developed works. Like there's no there's no secret to it. It's just physical repetition. That's all it is. Like there's no you know uh, um, you don't have to uh, uh, seek the Buddha out on the mountaintop to learn how to do it. You just have to sit down and do it. And that really was kind of eye opening. But as I got into working for a living, I realized that. A, I don't have the the same sort of uh, I don't know I don't know if it's musculature or whatever. Like you know, I, I I realized from from the jobs that I got hired to do that I was not hired to be Stanley Clark and I was not hired to be Jaco Bastorius. I was hired to be Duck John and James Chamberson and George Porter from the Meters. That's what I was getting hired to do was play a Fender bass, not an Alembic. A Fender bass, you know, to sound like that old classic, you know, uh, Motown, Stax, New Orleans kind of style. So, you know, I became that because that's what the world needed me to do. You know, they didn't need me to do fusion records. I, you know, I've certainly done records of my own and I've you know, taken tons and tons of bass solos and I, I love doing that. Um, but I don't get hired to do that for the most part, for the most part. So and it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You, know, you have to understand sort of what your function is in the band for that day. So, you know, Sam Moore from Sam and Dave, he tells a story about uh, firing Jimi Hendrix back in the day. Jimmy was playing his backing band and he was playing all of his, and they're like, what are you doing, man? Get out of here. We don't need you, right? And, and I keep thinking like, you know, that type of chops, like I, I've, I've, I've even told this to people too. I say, I'm playing the maximum number of notes per minute allowable on these gigs. Like I can't play any faster or I'm just going to get fired and I should get fired because, you know, that's not the function in, in that band kind of thing. So I like having chops and I like being able to play solos. But if you're doing a concert with Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, you're not taking a bass solo. That's not what you do, you know, and I'm, and I'm fine with that. Take a solo on uh, at the restaurant gig tomorrow night for the jazz set, you know. So, speaking for myself, like I certainly hit a wall where I was looking at but my my main sort of instrument instrument is guitar, and I was looking at you know the Alan Holdsworths, the um, the Tommy Emanuels, the Joe Satriani's, the Steve Vai's, and it's almost like if you look at Usain Bolt. And like there is this level of fine motor movement control right. that's like inherent in the DNA that makes for that virt virtuosic extra level. Um, 
and I just, I mean, I can play fast. Like, don't don't get me wrong, right. but like, right. a, am I sitting there shredding sixteenth notes at all? You know, two hundred beats per minute? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> no. So, could you talk a little bit about? really whether it was a question of the economic opportunities that brought you to the functional bass playing or whether it was that sort of that that fine motor control just wasn't at that virtuosic place well it's kind of both you know like again um to compare to not to compare myself to contrast myself to stanley clark like, you know, I've picked up Stanley's bass. It's an Alembic bass. It's a shorter scale instrument. The strings are very light and they're very low. And when you pick it up, you can just, and the neck is very narrow. It's an extremely fast bass. Mm. You pick it up and you just go, to, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I see, right. So his whole thing is set up to do that. Mm. You know, like the, the concept of the strings, the instrument, the wood, the amps, everything is set up to be, that gunslinger that he is, you know, and, and he's a master at it, you know, but um, when you put a Fender P bass, you know, in your hands with his big clunky strings and the big clunky neck and the whole thing, like um, you can't do that physically. You can't do it. Well, another example, Sam Moore, Sam and Dave were the original lead singers on Jaco Pastorius's first album, the song, come on, come over. If you know, that's like the first song on his, on his debut album. So we would occasionally perform that in, on, on stage with Sam, you know, especially if we were doing anything that was like, that was called such and such a jazz fest. You'd be like, oh, this is my jazz song. It's not jazzy at all, really. It was kind of, it's a soul number. So I'm playing Jocko's bass part. Jocko played it on a Fender jazz bass, which has a narrower neck, a slimmer neck. It's a faster playing instrument. And I'm playing it on a big clunky P bass because, you know, most of the show is to be like Duck Dunn style, stack style. So like I'm making the line, but I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of barely hanging on sort of like it, it, you sort of realize how much of their intentionality is built around the physicality of their instruments, the gauges of their strings, you know, and then beyond that, you know, the creativity. You were mentioning Alan Holdsworth before. Alan's like an evil genius. He's like and he's a mathematical genius and, and an autodidact. He's completely self-taught all those mathematical permutations he worked out on his own you know he didn't have anybody saying play this scale play that you know he doesn't read he never read, read music any of that stuff you know he just like sat in a room by himself and developed all this stuff and then was able to exist in a format like the bill bruford band or something like where he was they said like just go for it and do what you do like beyond having all these tonal concepts we just talked about then you also have to have a situation whereby you've got the elbow room and the support of your people around you to go do your thing. And for me, that's, that happens when I do my solo recordings, you know, my, mm -hmm. my, my trio recording project and that kind of stuff. That's where I get to play the solos. And I get to write the piece that, you know, the melodies as fast as I want to play it. You know, like I set all the parameters for that and I give myself the elbow room to do what I want to do. And I enjoy doing that as well. And, you know, if that makes money, great. You know, if I get famous doing that, then perhaps I'll become that, you know. But then you add, as you say, the economic thing where you become like, what do you get? What are you getting hired for and paid for? I'm like, well, I get hired to play Stacks and Motown and, and New Orleans stuff. That's what I get hired for. Looking at um, practice, uh, how do you like to segment or divide your practice time? Um, when I was doing more than an hour a day, like I do it in hour blocks and I make sure to do carpal tunnel stretches at the beginning and the end of both of those, because, uh, I've been very lucky. I've only really had one kind of wrist injury my whole career. So I would do hours with a break, hour with a break, you know, 15, 20 minute kind of break. Um, and uh, again, when I get to the situation where I have to prepare a lot of music for a certain gig, I'll, I'll make sure to kind of give myself breaks. Um, it depends in terms of like, you know, subject matter, it depends on, again, what I'm preparing for. If I'm just trying to learn repertoire, then I'm just, you know, running, running the book to kind of memorize all the parts kind of thing. Uh, so that's just sort of playing it as if I was playing with the concert. Um, if I'm trying to develop a certain thing, 
Um, like I said, this last year, I've been working on Arco playing on the uprights. So I've been working with the bow, but also simultaneously working with sight reading. So like, you know, I'll, I'll, I have a base clef version of the real book. So I just put that up on the stand, read through the page twice, turn the page, read through the page twice, both through the page twice, I should, should say. So I'm kind of simultaneously working on two things, which I find kind of attractive to me to sort of have that level of efficiency kind of developing two skills at once. But, you know, there were times back in the, in the music school days where you spend an hour on, you know, bebop uh, vocabulary and you spend an hour on arpeggios and you spend an hour on whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I don't do that as much anymore because now everything is related to whatever the next gig is. Could you talk a little bit about the time, if you don't mind, that you said you did actually injure your wrist? Was that a tendonitis, carpal tunnel? It was an overuse injury, and it came from being called to play an uh, acoustic bass gig. Uh, it was a wedding outdoors trio, like it's hard to hear yourself because all the you know all the sound just goes straight up. So I was unprepared for this, and I basically sort of just had to kind of play too hard for about four hours. So both of my wrists were kind of on fire for the rest of that summer, um, and. It's the only time that's ever kind of happened that way. It was a bunch of years ago. And, you know, I, I learned, I knew then too, you know, but I, I've, that, that lesson got reinforced. Like I really, if I have an upright gig coming up, I know I need to play a minimum of an hour a day for at least a week or two before, you know, just to be able to survive the gig and not get hurt. Um, and that, it was bad enough to the point because also I was very busy that summer. So, you know, I was constantly icing, icing my wrist down, icing down, icing down. And, and it wasn't really getting better. And I remember asking a friend of mine, you know, about acupuncture. And he said, uh, he had a number of guys like, yeah, you go to this guy down in Chinatown and he gives you the acupuncture. He said, oh, but one thing, because he saw me icing. He said, this guy will tell you, first thing he's going to tell you is always heat, never ice. Huh. And I was like, what? That's interesting. Because the sports medicine people tell you you can heat or ice. You can go either way. You just have to sort of change the stasis of the the injury you have to change the, the the form of it somehow and they kind of in equal parts recommend either heat or ice and this guy was like no no only heat so i switched from ice to then only heating and you know even uh, tiger balm and icy hot and, and heating pads and all that kind of stuff and it cleared up on its own like almost immediately Wow. So did you actually go for acupuncture or you I just took the second hand advice from the guy yeah. who knew the acupuncturist that was it. I, yeah, I got the advice. And I never made it down there. So <laughs> amazing. Now I can't. I can't. I'm. I'm not a medical professional. Oh yeah, no, no. We're, 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 but blanket statement. Not endorsing. Not endorsing. Not endorsing. Absolutely. And the and the big disclaimer is like I don't know. If, there's no way for me to prove that no. the injury wasn't going to get get better on its own anyway. Indeed. You know, because I'd had it for several months, kind of thing. But I did notice, like, as soon as I switched the heat, suddenly it seemed to get much better, much quicker. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, have you ever burned out from too much time spent on music specifically? <sighs> I mean, day to day, this whole week I've been exhausted, you know, but it's not from music. It's been from travel, from driving, that kind of thing. So like, you know, yesterday, I, I, you know, I had an hour sort of in the evening. I said, all right, I want to I want to do my my hour of daily practice, my Arco playing. And I just did not feel like it, but I made myself pick up the bass and start playing anyway, you know, and it, it, it kind of like, it, for me, getting started is always the hard part. And it's kind of almost any time, depending on how tired you are, you know, getting, just getting started, getting motivated is the hardest thing, but I've never really felt like, ugh, I never want to see a bass again. Mm. I've never really, I've never really got to that in, in my whole career, I don't think. When you are writing songs like uh, Crab Walk, for example, the new single, by the way, love the groove on that track. Thanks. Just the, the way everything comes in, it's, it's really just, it's a fun piece of just groove. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. A, a lot of fun. How do you experience that songwriting process? Are you experiencing it like a download where you're able to hear the end product and then you're sort of mapping it out? Are you starting with a bass line? How does that work? It's worked a couple of different ways, and it sort of is dependent on the project. Um, I did a recording trio project with a couple of friends of mine, also Berkeley kids, like-minded 
people. Um, my friend Jim Dower is a keyboard player. My friend Joe Garetti is a drummer. Joe toured with Moby kind of famously and Jim I dragged around the planet with me with the Sam Moore band for a bunch of years. Um, and we, we would convene over at the drummer's house uh, uh, on a Tuesday afternoon, at usually at one o'clock, because he was uh, building his recording rig at the time. So he was interested in recording technology and Jim and I were interested in writing and recording our compositions. So because I had a deadline, because I had to bring a tune in on Tuesday, you know, then I would sit down and try to get some information, some uh, some uh, inspiration really to try to figure out what was going to make me, you know, have a tune for, I, I, cause I gotta, I gotta have a tune. It was a deadline, the deadline thing sort of, so it, it, it could come from a, a, a rhythm idea. It could come from a baseline. It could come from a melodic fragment. It could come from just really anything. And over the course of probably four, four years or so, not every week, but every other week kind of thing, I, we've got about 75 tracks in the can of things which I spent the whole quarantine, by the way, remixing all those because they were just sitting, you know, unmixed in a folder on my hard drive doing nothing. So, you know, those have been seeing the light of day for the first time in 12 years, some of them. But like the Crab Walk, for instance, that one was started as a uh, a jam with me and the drummer, and, and he's got a, a different drummer, my friend Kenny Soul. He's got a recording rig in his basement over here in Queens. So we went over one day and we just like jammed through a few sort of, you know, baseline groove kind of things. Like we didn't really know where it was going to go. Um, and we did a couple of different days of this and a couple of different styles of things came out of it. And that particular one, so that was the bass and drums groove that we kind of jammed out with the form as it is. It's kind of like an A part and a B section and A and it sort of goes back and forth. So once we had that together and then the, the world shut down, the quarantine happened. Then I brought it back to my studio and I wrote the the horn melody that goes with it. Uh, sent that out to my friend Crispin Seo from the Uptown Horns, who's the guy who played the alto solo on James Brown's Living in America. He's a heavy, heavy cat. Sent that to him. As, uh, you know, we did all this by email, file exchange. He recorded his three saxes, one parts up in Connecticut. I uh, sent it to uh, my, my keyboard player, Jim Dower, up in Massachusetts, and he put down his keyboard parts up there and emailed them in. And then we got our friend Moses Mo from the band Mother's Finest to play guitar on it. Uh, we've been sending him files for some of his stuff in the last few years. And we asked him if we wanted to play in one of ours. And he was like, yeah, man, sure. So this blistering, you know, funk rock guitar part. And Mo is one of my childhood heroes, you know, getting to play with him. It's been amazing. So I didn't write anything specifically for Mo or Jim, but I think I wrote out all the horn parts. You know, and then allowed people to have their solo sections, their improv, improv sections as well. So it depends a little bit on the song, how I, I, I put it together. Do you prefer to write after listening to music for inspiration or from a clean slate? Again, this goes back to sort of like when I would have the deadline on Tuesday. Ah. Like I'm looking for anything, like what's going what's gonna to make me do something? And then I would hear like a Gladys Knight song. And I would hear the bass and the guitar doing something voiced in thirds or tenths, really, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So then I would immediately say, like, whoa, 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 what's that? And then and then turn off the music, turn it off. Like, no, I just, I, I had this idea. Bass and guitar voiced in tenths. And I'm like, okay, so now then I sit down and, and I try to figure out, like, a, you know, some some funky kind of meter -y -z sort of sounding line and then voice it out with a guitar or sometimes a, or a keyboard in tenths. And, and, and then, you know, massage that into a, a song form kind of thing. So the inspiration can come, come from any direction at any time. Uh, and I'm not necessarily looking for it. Like I wasn't, you know, going through my iTunes and saying, oh, what can I write today? But then I would, you know, occasionally you'll hear something like, whoa, what's that? What's that? You know, that could be a thing. I could turn that into something, you know, of my own sort of thing. Last question for you. Well, two questions, maybe. So... Uh, second to last one, uh, has performance anxiety ever threatened to impact or impacted your performance? The threat is always there. You know, like it, it, if you're going out to do something kind of biggish in front of a lot of people or in front of a TV camera, if you have zero butterflies, you might be a sociopath. You know, like that could be a problem. Like you need to have some sort of nervous energy going. But one of the things I sort of learned or read about early on, there was a book called The Inner Game of Music, written by the sports writer, had written The Inner Game of Tennis. That was the original book. They adapted it to music. 
It was all about sort of performance anxiety. So what happens is when you have that adrenaline going, you have to know certain things like, you know, if you can do something at, you know, 200 beats per minute in your practice room, you can probably only do it at about a buck 85 on stage reliably. You know ah, what I'm saying? Yes. Like, yep. there's a little 10% sort of reduction that kind of comes naturally, you know, no matter what it is. And so sometimes I've learned to, you know, if I really need to nail something at 200, you've got to practice it at 210. Or 220 even. Or 220, right. That's right. right. Yeah. Exactly right. So you have to over-prepare in a way. So when you've over-prepared like that, I mean, you, you go into a Broadway show, you know, the first time you sub on a Broadway show, for instance, you get one shot at it. There's no rehearsal. You have to do a, a live performance, you know, with, with a fully paid audience. And it has to be right, 100% right, you know, or you won't be called back again. So you spent like a month preparing for this one moment in your entire career. It feels like Hank's in the balance. So like you can really like by the second song, you're going like, I, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. I want to put down my bass. I want to quit music. I don't ever want to do this ever again. You know, and then you kind of like, you know, have to talk yourself off the bridge, you know, as you're doing it. So, uh, yeah, that can be daunting. Um, but the other thing is like this adrenaline thing. There's a way to channel that adrenaline. It can make you play, you know, 50 percent, not 50, but, you know, 25 percent worse. Or it can make you play 25 percent better if you channel it into like, oh, this is exciting. This is good. If you make it into a good thing. And suddenly, like, you can lean into things and actually make it work in your favor kind of thing. But that, that takes a lot of years of, of practicing and failing quite publicly, you know, before you just kind of learn how to channel that into something positive. Have you ever tried playing psychological games with yourself in those situations and, like, trying to turn it into a situation that you're feeling gratitude for as opposed to fear and then sort of trying to replace the well of fear with gratitude or happiness or contentment or something like that? I, you know, I probably have done every possible combination of that. It, you know, you can imagine because it, it's varying levels of, of, of panic. People have, have, uh, have, have described playing in a Broadway show, like especially if you've done it for a bunch of times, like you're playing your 50th show or something. They say it's just like, you know, uh, moments of, uh, of boredom interspaced with, you know, brief flashes of white hot panic. You know, you just like, you suddenly like make a stupid mistake and like, oh Jesus, and your whole, your whole body tenses up, you know. So then you have to, again, talk yourself down off the bridge and sort of say, yes, I know how to do this. I've done this before. I've done it 50 times before. I'm not going to get fired for making one mistake. P.S. You can get fired for making one mistake, you know. So it's like, yeah, I've, I've done all of that. And sometimes it works out. And sometimes it, it must, whatever you can do to sort of relax yourself to get through the situation is, is the way to do it. You know? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you can check out Am I Famous Yet? Um, which is everywhere books are uh, sold. You can also find the new funky single Crab Walk and so much more at funkboy.net. That's F-U-N-K-B-O-Y.net. Ivan Funk Boy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it.